Um, just a quick introduction. Dr. Edward Downs is an associate professor of public relations at Boston University in the College of Communication. And what year did you come? 1998. Uh, 98. Yeah. So we've known each other almost 20 years. That's right. You're across the hall and around the corner when That's you exactly first right. came. That's exactly right. And um, he's earned his PhD at Syracuse University. And his advisor was Dr. Otto Lerlinger when he Mel. came. Oh, I mean, Mel right. DeFleur. Right. Um, Mel was our chair for a while at BU at the College of Communication. And he recruited Eddie to come and join us at the College of Communication. And he began the research he's going to talk about tonight when he was at Syracuse with Mel. And uh, Mel's very proud of his former student bringing him along. And now Mel is down in Louisiana right. with an endowed professorship at LSU. We all miss him that he left BU. Um, prior to joining academia, before he went to Syracuse to get his PhD, he had about 10 years work experience in Washington, D.C. And some of the organizations he worked for included, you know, the United States Congress, which is where he developed this interest in this research. Um, he's done, since he's been at BU, over 30 peer-reviewed papers. And he's been going to international conferences, most recently, as you heard, in Saudi Arabia. Um, King Saud University in Riyadh, he, and then he also has presented in Turkey, England, um, India, and you went to Dubai a, a, a short time ago. He's published several studies in his scholarly journals, such as Journals of Mass Communication Educator and the Journal of Public Relations Research. Now what he's going to share with us tonight is the results of almost 25 or 20, yeah, 24 years of study, um, which will be included in his book, The Press Secretary, The Story of Capitol Hill's Image Makers, which he's hoping to be published this year. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming. And we're eager to hear what you have to say. First things first, Janice was my mentor and continues to mentor me. She's been an unbelievable friend. And she's very, very smart. Oh, please. She's very, very smart and kind. I want to also mention, too, Dr. Dan, because, you know, I have to share with this something with you guys, and that is that, you know, sometimes you're called to do these things, and they just sort of say, well, just go do it. She's been incredibly helpful to me. She, we recruited some months ago. We've been on the phone two or three times. I've sent her information. She's offered me some information back. And things that would have made her life easier, like saying, well, you just just pick up a case study. I said, would you look at some case studies for me and maybe offer some suggestions? She said, yes. And at about five minutes of five, I wrote her, I said, you don't have to put this up if you have time. She comes over and really puts it up. So really, I want to give these two questions. I'm just saying that, that's really good stuff. And I, you know, I get called to speak sometimes, and you don't, you don't get this kind of support. It's really good. And she was brilliant because she didn't know what, what you all would be after. So this is great. Thanks for letting me be here tonight. Thank you for being here. Seriously. And I looked at the list of people who had been here before me. What the hell am I doing here? <laughs> God, these guys are big deals. So this is really, this is kind of fun. What we'll do tonight um, with you guys is let's take, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes, something like that. And we can talk a little bit about these, who these people are. And specifically, why you should be interested in what they're doing. Because their work influences your life. It really does. So we'll talk about that. Then I thought what we could do, Dr. Dana had mentioned a case study. We'll just read a case study together and begin thinking about that in the context of what we'd spoken, what we'd just spoken about. Then we'll finish the presentation. And then we'll do a quick discussion on the case studies and questions and stuff. Is that good? We'll get out in an hour, an hour and a half or so. Is that, is that, hey, Eddie. <laughs> nice. so, so that's what we can do. How's that sound? Here's what's so interesting about this, though. You know, if we go to, to this slide, we say the press secretary, think about this just a little bit. U.S. Law Sausage 100 and 435. Can anyone here name, absent the professors, why that's up there. If you do, I'll buy you a cup of coffee and a tuna fish sandwich and some chips. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Want me to tell you? Here's the deal. United States law. People say this, if you enjoy the law, or if you enjoy sausage, you should never watch either one being made. It's just pure confusion when laws are made. There's horse trading, there's behind the scenes deals, and appropriate to what we're talking about tonight, there's communication management. But beyond that, there's perception management. How is this law going to be perceived? How is the Affordable Health Care Act, Obamacare, going to be perceived? What about abortion, the death penalty, drugs, alcohol? How are these perceived? You see, because perception becomes what? Reality. It becomes our reality. It becomes your reality. So if we return to this slide and we look at this, we say U.S. law, sausage. There are 100 senators in the United States, 100 senators. And like when you just went to Capitol Hill, when you just went to Capitol Hill, when you faced the front of the hill from the mall, the, on the left-hand side were the three buildings that housed those hundred senators. There's also 435 representatives. Now this is how it's broken down. This is just the real basic piece. Two senators from each state, hence 100 senators, two from each of the 50 states, right? 435, that's based on population. So roughly, give or take about a half million people, 600,000, 700,000, those make up the, the districts. So if we multiplied about 6,000 or 7,000 by 435, every person in the United States would be represented. So, okay, so you got the piece? Now, I, had admit, I had mentioned to you guys initially, I said, but this influences your life. And this is important. You said, well, come on, that's just hyperbole. I don't believe it's hyperbole, I think it does. Let me ask you this real quickly. Has anyone heard a message from Capitol Hill in like the last month? Something about Capitol Hill. There was a vault, there was a law, there was a member of Congress in the paper. They're all over. There's several thousand stories that come out of, out of there. But here's the interesting thing. There's a really good chance that the person who put that message out was not the member of Congress. That is, was not the senator or the member of the House of Representatives. But it was some public relations person. Some hack, some flack, some spin doctor, some manipulator. I'm being a little bit harsh here. <laughs> but you're getting the idea is that someone crafted that message and crafted that image so you would perceive the law and the individual behind that law in a certain way so that would become your reality. And you've heard about priming, you've heard about framing, for example. The press secretaries are, are inherently doing this. But here's where it gets really interesting. At least I think it becomes interesting. Interesting. I'll bet you we have two real scholars in the room, so we won't include them. But I'll bet you, uh, what kind of sandwich was this? Uh, I don't know, I think chicken. Okay, chick I'll bet you a chicken sandwich yeah. that not one person within 10 miles of here can name one press secretary. <laughs> what I can almost guarantee, though, is that within 10 miles, most of those people have heard a press secretary's message. So there's something that's going on here. Who are these people? What do they do? Who are these people who build up the image of the members of Congress, who tell us about their laws, who have us perceive laws and issues and individuals in certain ways, so those laws and individuals become our reality? If you look at the, at the, pre, at the current presidential campaign, how do you perceive Donald Trump? How do you perceive Hillary Clinton? How do you perceive that person? To some degree, that perception is your reality. And the consequences of that, those perceptions are significant because that may influence your life. I tell the students with whom I work, they say, well, it doesn't influence my life. I say, well, how old are you? I say to a guy, he says, I'm 18 years old. No, he says, I'm 20 years old. I said, did you sign up for selective service? He says, yes. I said, so if a draft comes, you're going to go. He said, no. Well, I said, well, you're going to jail. That's your choice. Because there's been a, a notion, there's been a law that indicates he had to sign up for selective service. Does that make sense to you? So when you look at so much that goes on, there really is an impact that goes on. But again, the people behind this impact are people who we don't know, we don't see, we don't name, who shape the perceptions of members of Congress, which produce the laws which become our reality. Is that, is that, 
Is that pretty, that's sort of like an introduction. Is that good? Okay. So now I'll go to a few slides, okay, and show you guys a few things. This is just, this is like the most boring slide in the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go real quick. But that's, that's what, what Dr. Barrett had mentioned. Back in 93, I started a lot of this research. And we should be at 21 and 22 because this summer I'll be giving a paper in England and in Croatia on these guys. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So I'll do that. The politician will, it will I'm going I'm to ask Dr. Barrett, and then, you know Marshall McLuhan. Yeah. Okay, I'll just ask you in a minute to tell us who he is. No, you can. Oh, let me tell him, okay. The politician will be only too happy to advocate in favor of his image because that image will be more powerful than he could ever be. I mean, I'd rather have a, a, a term that wasn't gender specific, but fair enough. Marshall McLuhan was a great thinker, a great, great thinker. And he thought a lot about political communication. And his work permeated not only the academy or academics or educational institutions, but popular culture as well. But isn't that interesting? The image is more powerful. Is Hillary's image more powerful than she? How about Donald Trump? Just something to think about. Now, return to the 100 senators. What about their images? Who creates those? That's largely the work of their PR people, namely their press secretaries. So here's, the, here's like the, the continuation. Perception is reality shaped through image. One more time, perception it's reality shaped through image. Who presses, who does the image? The image which is much more powerful than the politician could ever be, the press secretary. So I like to think of these guys as satellites. So how many of you guys have been to Congress, have, have visited, you been to Washington, DC? Mm -hmm. Have you guys been there? Yeah, but we were there? Just, just from outside. Just from outside. You were, you were there. Okay, if you look at a, at, a, at a nickel, on the back of the nickel, there's a picture of the Capitol. It's a nickel, right, the nickel. Mm -hmm. And so on that capital, you can go up there, you see these folks walking around. And they're relatively young. The average age when I, did, when I last collected data on them was about 32 or 31. And they're running around. You see, because they each work for one of those 100 senators or one of those representatives, shaping that person's image. And those senators and representatives, I call them satellites, because each congressional office is an independent employer. That makes sense to you? So when we use the term press secretary, they might call the person communications director, press aide, is press assistant, something like that. And if you think about it a little bit further, the term press secretary is kind of outdated because it's really not press, is it? Mm -hmm. Especially in the new media environment. It's something much different, but they still use that term. So that's what I did in that. It's interesting, this is what somebody told me. It's interesting, you mentioned that you found only 50 pages or so that discuss the press secretaries. This is in the academic literature, right? That is because we are really doing our jobs. This is important. The better job I do, the less you'll see my name or face. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I return to the question that I posed to you guys a couple minutes ago. Name one press secretary. Yeah. Interesting, huh? So, I think the hardest thing, especially these are quotes from press secretaries, I think the hardest thing, especially when I've encountered new press secretaries, was that they couldn't divorce their feelings from what they had to do for their boss. Okay, stop reading, stop reading, just let me get you here. Their boss is how they refer to the member of Congress. That's the, the terminology, my boss, my boss, my boss, my boss. It's really a relationship where there is someone superior, and inferior, but that flips, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute, okay? My boss, so here's the deal. Was they couldn't divorce their feelings of what they had to do for their boss. They had to forget that they didn't exist, that they were actually their bosses, that they were also their boss's spouses, and play both roles, and play both roles constantly, all the time. My job isn't to promote myself and write my things with my name on them. My job is to promote my boss and get his name in the paper and his picture, and, and they just went on that. Make sense to you? The second thing we found is, I once had a quote, you ever pick up a newspaper and you know, you know like you'll see a, a traditional newspaper, they do it online sometimes too, and they'll be, what, they'll be like, they'll take a quote from that, and it'll be like a little bit bigger font, and that's a Poe quote. So I once had a Poe quote in a large newspaper, the kind they usually use for members, members of Congress, and I was really uncomfortable with it. I'm a little mortified when I see stuff like that. Now here's why I think this is an interesting thing to think about. Because when we think about the country, when we think about our lives here in the US, these press secretaries represent the entire nation. 
right? So that's from Key West, Florida, up to Northern Maine, across to California, down to New Mexico and, and Arizona, and up into the Alaskan Tundra. So they're all over. And this is what they're dealing with. They're doing all these things. And this is the first time, my book will actually be the first time that we talk about these people. So people on every inch of the country are receiving their messages. That's you. So take a breath for a minute. Take a breath. This is sort of the mundane things that they do, right? These are the things that they do. So when you look at the description of a press secretary, they pitch media, they update, they advise, they monitor, they write, they think, they do, they hope. And then the question comes up, what about new media? How have these media changed or rocked their worlds? Now, for the sake of discussion, some of the literature differentiates, I'm going to use the term new media, but I'm really talking about social media, digital media, emerging media, alternative media. I mean, I'm not enough of a scholar that I can give you the specific conceptual definitions, but we know what we mean by new media. So what's happened? Well, something's happened because all of a sudden they were traditionally using this meter and the chain went like this. Congressional press secretary, reporter, story about the member of Congress. Right? Congressional press secretary, member of Congress from LaSalle, representing LaSalle, story about LaSalle in the Boston Globe. Right? That was the traditional thing. But now, as you know, the media have rocked their world. Something has happened. And what I can share with you is this. The changes are not massive. Massive was the printing press. The changes are profound. We have never before communicated among ourselves, and we've never before communicated from Capitol Hill with these tools. Now, when I talk about this, people say, what do you mean it's profound? I say, well, think about this. This has never happened in history, and you can't imagine that, nor can I. Can you guys imagine yesterday, last year, this is where it gets fuzzy, five years ago, 10 years ago? Now multiply that by thousands, and that's history. This has never happened. A press secretary never blogged until about the time I, start te I started teaching at Boston University. If, if we look at this entire screen, I'm not, I'm not gonna write that. If we look at this entire screen, and this represents all of human communication, if I do a little dot there, that's the percentage of time in all of human communication when we use these technologies. So one of the things that I'm trying to track and frankly, one of the things that's holding up my book a little bit that I'm a little scared of is I'm in a process of talking to press secretaries on the phone, talking to them now about how you use new media. Most things haven't changed. The age, the demographics, the goal, the relationship with the member, the terminology. Those have remained remarkably the same. But what I'm trying hard to track this to say, what is this doing? What is this doing? Because we know that's it. So again, I suggest... The new technology, what do we do with new media, are not massive changes. Those came with the, print, with the printing press. Those were massive. These are profound. They are redefining space. You can hit Saudi Arabia. You can contact Saudi Arabia right now. Time, right? And I'll illustrate this with a story. Then I'll do a couple of slides, then we'll do a case study. Is this making sense to you guys? Okay. Press secretaries are not robots. And communicating with their audience remains at its core as much an art as a science practiced differently by different press secretaries each with unique strengths and weaknesses, with varying degrees of, of success, each form in a different member. Does that make sense to you? So when we think about these, that was, that's what makes them particularly challenging, that there are so many, they all work for independent employers, they all have different personalities, and members of Congress, of course, have different political views. But I'll challenge you, turn on the TV any night, and you're going to see a whole host of personalities. Not as diverse as we should be. We have, to, we have to do better at that. But the point is, relatively speaking, quite a diverse group of people. Here's our friend Anthony Weiner on the right. Do you remember him? This is probably a good time to do a case study. <laughs> Anthony Weiner is a member of Congress on the right-hand side. And he was very outspoken. And he was texting suggestive pictures of himself to young women. And he said, I didn't do it. And he got caught and he left Congress. What's his press secretary supposed to do with that? 
Imagine you're a press secretary and you get there. So let's take one of these case studies, and maybe for 20 minutes or so, we can read the case study together, and then we'll discuss this from the perspective of a press secretary. Is that okay? So I'd like to do a vote, if you guys would. Poll staffer caught kissing. So one of the members, the member of Congress was kissing one of his staffers. Don't worry, so we're gonna keep it PG, don't worry. <laughs> Everything's all right, don't worry, don't worry. And this one is, Congressman decides to teach little kids about suicide bombers. So, I want to show of hands. Who wants to do the case study on Congressman decides to teach, I kind of like this one, but how Congressman decides to teach little kids about suicide bombers? Who wants to do that? One? Okay. So I'm going to assume, you don't have to put you up your hand, that you would prefer to do the poll staff for caught kissing. It's kind of fun. So let's look at this. And what we can do is we can read this together. It's very short. And again, Dr. Dana was good enough to suggest this, and it's really an ideal case study. And to be honest with you, I was thinking when I teach, I should do more of this. So let's get started. Poll, that's a politician and staffer. Now, before you guys read, let's read it together. Let me, let, me put, let me situate this for you, okay? This is an individual member of Congress, one of 435 representatives, right? Now, technically, members of Congress are both representatives and senators, but today when we refer to them, we refer to senators as the people who belong to the U.S. Senate, and members of Congress as people who belong to the U.S. House of Representatives, okay? So with that said, this is a member. There's a very conservative member, and in the Christian tradition, there are fundamentalists. There are folks who are, uh, uh, there was a strong uh, moral code which they readily share. I think that's, I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. So let's look at this. So he, the point to that is he's on the right. He's, he's also a Christian, a conservative Christian. Precisely, and that's what we got here. That's it. Yep. Oh, you got it. Thanks. thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> And he played that up in his campaign. He played it up in his campaign. Does, and does a 16-year marriage with his five children. That, 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 we'll, we'll get to it, man. <laughs> no, that's okay. Doesn't he, he does, I mean, you talk about somebody who looks a little stressed. <laughs> Give this, I'm going to get Eileen, my girlfriend, the psychiatrist, and get him some clonopin, just so we can relax. <laughs> Let's get started. Freshman GOP, now GOP is what we call the grand old party of the Republicans. Vance McAllister of Louisiana, who ran it for office as a principal conservative Christian has been caught on video in a romantic encounter with a woman believed to be his congressional staff just before Christmas. Now, you're the press secretary. You may have known about this. It might have been bubbling, or you might not have known about it. But regardless, now everybody knows about it. What are you going to do? Let's continue. I don't know what it is. The Archuna Citizen newspaper best in, in, in West uh, Monroe, Louisiana, posted on a December 23rd surveillance video purportedly from inside McAllister's district office in Monroe. The video shows McAllister kissing a woman identified by a newspaper as a congressional staffer for the first term lawmaker. Oh boy. Federal payroll records show she is a part time aide who began working for McAllister the day after he won his last seat. Now, think about this. I want to put this in perspective for you guys. You know how you're hearing about this and it has your attention? I think it's a, it's a, it's a good story in the sense that it's a story that it grabs our attention. And we can talk about the news values, etc., if you want to. But the point of this, of this notion is this. This story, what you're hearing about with interest, certainly interested people in this district, yes? So we're not talking about some sort of obscure social political funding as it relates to agricultural subsidies in Sudan. This is right here, and we can all get it, because God, I hope we've all been kissed at least once. Let's continue. Now, McAllister won a special election on November 16th to, re to replace Republican Alexander. McAllister won in the heavily Republican district by playing up his conservative credentials, including his Christian faith and his 16 years marriage. Mm -hmm. McAllister's Washington door was locked Monday. He issued a statement in the afternoon apologizing for the incident and asking forgiveness. Who do you think wrote the statement? The press secretary. Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing it. All that I know over the years is that the press secretary wrote it. We can talk, if we have time, we can talk about how those are constructed and what you look for and stuff. McAllister also asked for privacy as his family deals with the fallout from the scandal. McAllister and his wife Kelly had five children. Here's a quote. There's no doubt I've fallen short and I'm asking for forgiveness. I'm asking for forgiveness from God, my wife, my kids, my staff, and my constituents who elected me to serve, McAllister said in his statement. Who do you think wrote the statement? 
Probably the press secretary. <laughs> Trust is something I know has to be earned, whether you're a husband, a father, a congressman. I promise you everything I can to earn back the trust of everyone I've disappointed. So what they've done at this point, don't keep reading because we'll just we'll read it together. They set up a strategy, a response to the crisis, right? And what they're doing, unlike when Clinton, remember, denied the crisis and then got caught. This guy is saying, which I think is kind of smart in a way, let me get it off the plate and put it out there. Tell all and tell it first, and that, that's oftentimes a good way to handle the crisis. So as hard as it is to, to imagine, I think, is my guess. Well, I'll just say real quick. I think the press secretary might have done something smart here in the sense that he got the story out there. Otherwise, it's going to dribble and dribble and dribble and dribble. If you don't believe me, look at the front page of the New York Times and the major dailies during the Lewinsky scandal. That story just dribbled and dribbled and dribbled. <laughs> It never went away because they didn't say all and say it first. So I think that's probably smart. Now, a cynic might say he didn't have an alternative. Well, maybe he didn't because he's caught on video. But anyway, you get the idea. Okay, so McAllister added, from day one, I've always tried to be an honest man. I ran for Congress to make a difference and not just to be another politician. I don't want to make a political statement on this. I would just simply like to say that I'm very sorry for what I've done. Well, I realize I serve the public, I would, appreci I would appreciate the privacy given to my children as we get through this. GOP House leaders also offered no official reaction to the McAllister report. It was first posted on Monday afternoon in the newspaper. The local newspaper did not specify how to obtain the video, which came from inside the McAllister's district. It's not. <laughs> so, there's the situation, right? What? What role might the press secretary play? Well, again, they're independent employers, so I can't say definitively this is how I do it. But I can say what I imagine probably happened. One thing that probably happened, let's get these other questions I put together. One thing that probably happened was they crafted a statement, how are we going to respond, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good statement in the sense that you admit guilt, you say you're sorry, and you move forward. Now, if we look at the Lewinsky scandal, something interesting, at least to contemplate, what we found with Clinton was that he did not admit until the blue dress came up, and then he was forced to admit. Mm -hmm. I oftentimes wonder, what would have happened if he had admitted early? I'll tell you, I know one thing would have happened. There wouldn't have been speculative story after speculative story after speculative story feeding people about his indiscretions. That wouldn't have been there. No, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I can't say, but I know he was a brilliant man, good politician, great charisma, willing to triangulate, could have been one of the great ones, perhaps. So somebody said, wait a minute, if, if, if he had admitted to the Lewinsky scandal, they would have, the right wing would have hit him really hard. And I said, yeah, they would have hit him real hard. He would have got knocked down. But then you know what would have happened? He would have gotten up. And from that point forward, the truth is out there. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure that this story necessarily, that this press secretary did the wrong thing. I, my sense is maybe a good thing. But let's take a quick look at some of these questions. And again, Dr. Dana, help me to come up with these. Do you guys know the term public? Have you used that term? Public is any group who can organize an impact an organization. Loosely termed in, in everyday language, they're what we call audiences. So let me just, just, just real quick, let's just start, thanks. What public, just real, just real quick off the top of your head, might be effective? Yeah, his constituents. Because the constituents can certainly organize and impact the member of Congress. Yeah, so the constituents. It gets a little tougher if you want. Do you have, do you have an idea? Public? Um, of another public other than his constituents? Yes, yes. Um, I, kind of, I feel like I'm kind of putting it in the spot. Well, they're, they're his staffers. Yeah, absolutely. So the internal public, the staff, there's, always, there's an external public and an internal public. Like, internal public is usually the staffers, the employees, the board of directors, those kind of people, so the staff. Let's continue on. And if you don't know, it's okay. Any idea? Say the media. <laughs> the media. Well, that's exactly right, the media. So the media can certainly organize. Now, I don't know what the media in his district are like. I don't know if they're people who are predisposed to like him or to dislike him, but we can certainly say that media play a role and of course, that's the cry of the right wingers, is that the liberal media doesn't give us a fair shake, and so we don't get the story. That's the cry of them. It's, it's a much larger discussion than we can do here. But I don't know, but the media could certainly organize for him or against him. I guess um, there are people who support him. 
Yeah, that we could say his constituents won, but we could also say, yes, people who support his campaign. Someone over the years gives him money to keep campaigning. What do you think? Um, I know it gets harder as you go along. Well, how well, about... What is family? No, his family might count. Maybe it's his, his family. It's interesting, when we talk about family, oftentimes it's an extension of the individual. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? But it could not be family. Public, yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know the answer, but I, I, that's, I'm just not sure. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's I think it's a really good guess, being that you're like number four down there. <laughs> so as we think about this, who else might be involved? Well, for potentially the courts could be involved. Mm -hmm. That's potential, right? There could be activist groups who could be involved, right? Activist groups on one end or the other. Does that make sense? The guy got hit pretty hard. So what I don't know... Oh, the religions. Yeah, the Christian groups. Oh, sure. I was, yeah, exactly right. I think that's right. You know, and I was thinking, you asked that activist groups, you said Christian. I think yeah. it would be much the same thing. That right makes sense. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you what I did was I talked to a press secretary about this issue, a former press secretary. He was kind of upset. He had worked for Republican, but it was a moderate Republican, and he said the guy's caught in trouble. But he said, if you notice, if someone attempts to lead a moral life and slips, but talks about trying to lead a moral life, that person is readily criticized. Mm -hmm. If someone leads an immoral life and is caught, that person is not criticized. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you put that in the message, but it's an interesting thing to think about. Was this a bad person? I don't, I mean, I don't know. Did he have high ideals? I assume he did, because he spoke loudly about them, and he was caught. But was someone who has less high ideals, who arguably is immoral, and they get caught, it might not impact them the same way. So it's kind of an interesting conundrum. That's what he told me. So I don't know if, that, I don't know if you guys would buy that or not. But at least it's something to think about. OK, determine three questions. Here's the thing. OK, so you do this. now. Dr. Barrett, you guys, I mean, she, she actually kind of, she knows this, and I'm kind of laughing because it's kind of so elementary for you, but when you think about it, you want to make sure that you know the questions that are going to be asked, right? And the key to that is, so let me ask you this. Let's just go down the line. This might be a little bit easier. What questions might a reporter ask? And I'm using the term reporter broadly. Right, that can be a blog or whatever. But what questions might you want to get ready? Let's kind of start here. What, what's a question someone would ask about this? Mm -hmm. Any ideas? Like how, if this was just like a one-time thing, or has it been going on longer? Good question. question. So you got to get an answer for that. Okay, so so we write that down, and then begin to draft an answer. Mm -hmm. Then is this the case study? This is what I'm doing this the right way. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah. All right, so, so <laughs> No, see, it's a case study is a great idea. I got to. I don't do them in class. I should be doing them. Really? Anymore. No, I don't. I should be doing them more. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, um, do you think we can do better? Yeah. Do you think you can do better? Have you learned your lesson? And of course, yeah, you find a way to answer that. Oh, uh, what a family problem caused him this. What's that? Family problem. What a family him problem. Between him and his wife. Now, I want to share something with you about crisis communication. What we've done here, and we'll get to you guys in just a second. We've turned the table. It's out on the table, and now we're finding out how to respond. The truth is out. So that's actually the process. That, that's, it's a difficult thing, but it's a good thing when you get to the point where you know what's there and you can begin to determine questions and start. Does that make sense to you? No, it's hard. It's hard. Press secretaries have told me, many have told me, this is really hard, it's a scandal, I hate it, it makes my life awful. But to do that, you've got to do it. I equate it with Eileen's poor patients when they're sick and they're schizophrenic and they're suffering. Then they take some medication. It's hard because it doesn't always work. Everything doesn't turn around right away. Admit, but it's it's that they've turned and they've begun to get healed. I don't want to be overly overly um, sentimental to this, but I do want to say that this is generally a positive process when you're doing it. another question. Um, is this the first time you've ever cheated on your wife? And <laughs> what other lies have you told the public? Now this is a great question, and the answer is I'm not sure you got to answer it. <laughs> That's a great question. Do you owe an answer to that to say this is the first time? I don't know. It's just something to think about. I'm not sure. Uh, I was going to do kind of the same thing. Is she, is she the only one? Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would say so. One thing that, that, that hit me interesting, is there any kind of quid pro quo to this? You know, is there anything that comes up like, you know, you're, you're hiding information and because you've hid this, somebody can influence legislation or influence your choices or something like that? 
I don't know if the professors, if you guys wanted to add anything, I just, um, but if there is something that comes up, please feel free to add it. But that's something to think about, isn't it? What questions? I probably think something about trust. How, how would you expect the public to regain your, to regain the trust in you? Something kind of similar to what we talked about. It's a, you know what? I was trying to, that's a, core, that's a really good question. How can we trust you? How do we do it? Interesting, isn't it? Let's go to the, so if we have time, we can talk a little bit about how you might want to answer those. But the goal here is to give you a kaleidoscopic view rather than the tactics, the things that you would want to consider. But I can share a couple things about that. When you answer the questions, you must be truthful. <laughs> right? Second thing, when you answer these questions, your answers, generally speaking, must be understandable and succinct. Number th three, the, when you answer these questions, they must be affinitive with your strategy. So since you've told all, you can't then answer questions and pull back and say, well, that wasn't accurate. The other thing about the answer to the questions is you want to, this is always tricky, you want to talk about the benefits of what you're doing rather than the features. So the feature is you cheated on your wife. The benefit is I've learned my lesson, I'll never do it again. Mm -hmm. The benefit is I promise we all, I, I'm not, this is not a religious thing, but according to the, we all slip in God's eyes, and so there's a consequence. I know that I'm forgiven by God, and I hope I'll be forgiven by the constituents. You get the idea, right? So that is, I didn't even get religious out of you guys. I'm just saying that, does that make sense to you guys? So as we think about that, that's what's, how we would generally do it. Let's go to the third one. Uh, prepare a brief statement, one paragraph. I thought that we, what we could do with this is, in the interest of time, that I think is something that might be interesting for you to think about. A brief statement. But I think the operative word, I think, is brief. It's got to be succinct and to the point. And you integrate these things, these talking points that you want to do. Does that make sense to you? So where are we now? Well, we start with this tragedy of this crisis. This could kill his career. I don't, I don't know. I don't, like, I don't know. But there is a means through which you can dig yourself out of this hole. Maybe it works. Bill Clinton had a much more significant high exposure crisis than this. And to be frank with you, if he were talking in town, I'd love to go see Bill Clinton. I mean, people want us, you know what I mean? He's, he's a rock star. In the so he has certainly worked himself out of a crisis. Or, or, or the larger culture. <laughs> Number four, assume you're a press secretary. Now, this is a great one to think about. Just, just let me ask you guys before, before you read it. Remember the quote up there where I said, you know, you have to be like your boss's wife, and you have to, be, you have to do that? This deals with that. Assume you're a press secretary who vehemently disagrees with the congressman's actions. You see these as awful, unforgivable. And you're deeply offended by them. You put trust in this person. You've gotten behind him or her. Your friend said you're not because you're Christian and conservative. We think you're not. But he said, I don't care. You just lay it on the line. <clears throat> How would you personally deal with these feelings? Well, simultaneously defending the congressman. I don't have an answer here, but I can share with you what most press secretaries say. The larger question is, are most press secretaries affinity with a member of Congress? Do their views match their boss's views? And I've only found one exception in all the research where someone who was not of the same political party worked for someone of a different party. And in that case, there was a Republican senator and an independent press secretary. So I would say, with some exceptions, there's a large degree of agreement to begin with. Make sense to you? There's a large degree. And maybe some people there isn't. They can just kind of do it as a job. But there's usually a lot of your agreement. But this is consternation on the big issues, abortion, death penalty. There's usually a lot of synergy. They're in that, right? But I mean, there's some ways that they'll kind of creep part way and rationalize and say, well, maybe this, maybe that. For example, you might say, I'm against the war. The press secretary might say, well, I'm against the war too, but I'm OK if we send in troops as long as there aren't ground troops. And the member of Congress says, we will not send troops. Do you see how there's a degree of agreement that you can have on this? Right? So if we look at abortion, for example, I'm against abortion, except if the mother's life is in danger. Somebody else would say, I'm definitively against. You see, that, that, that there'll be degrees. So oftentimes, that's where we fall. But this is the problem that many press secretaries, not many, but occasionally you hear it. I, this, is the, this is really makes me uncomfortable. But I'll tell you what generally happens. They defend the member vehemently. 
It's an interesting ethical question. Because in this case, your ultimate loyalty belongs to the member of Congress, not to your personal values. Unless your personal values are a member of Congress. There was one press secretary with whom I spoke. And he said, you know, I was working for a senator. And when I sat down, they said, would you take a bullet for the senator? Well, that's strong. But it illustrates the point. But this is a true story. Bill told me this, and he said I could share it. This, is, this isn't made up. The senator for whom he worked had died, and he came from the Jewish tradition. Now, uh, Jewish tradition is a beautiful tradition. I don't understand it fully. It's not my tradition. But I understand that the grave, you take a shovel and you put dirt on the grave, and then the next person, I don't know if anybody's from that tradition, but that's, that's how it's done, right? Yes. Right, okay, so the member of Congress, the senator, is being buried. Everyone had put something on the grave. The group moves away. Who was left? His chief of staff, 100 yards away, putting the rest of the dirt on the grave. I got goosebumps on that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Some people say, why do you keep researching? It's great stuff, you know? So that's the thing. I mean, that's, I think, what we have to, to look at. And then the last question that I'd propose is, Eddie, can I just Absolutely. go to the last one? I just wanted to, you've mentioned Clinton a number of times. Yeah. And if you recall, his press secretary was Mike McCurry. Correct. And what happened is Clinton did not tell the truth to Mike McCurry. Plausible deniability. Right. right. And so what happened is day after day, Clinton was going out to the press and basically saying this did not happen, there was no affair, and you know, basically defending Clinton. Because Clinton lied to everybody. He lied to not just the press, but his senior staff and all the people in his cabinet, and then to his press secretary. So what so he so when the truth finally came out with the blue dress and Clinton couldn't deny it anymore, this was the conundrum that he was in, McCurry. you know, that, yeah, Mike McCurry. And he said, what do I do? He said, do I stay, keep working for this guy who lied to me and lied to the country and lied to everyone else? And he said, no. And he quit the best job for a press secretary in the world, press secretary for the President of the United States, because his values and his ethics he felt were more compelling to hold up than the job of being press secretary. So the other piece of this, and of course it is in this case it was a video, but the other piece of it is if you're working for a senator or a congressman or a president who lies about what he did, and of course that guy lied mm -hmm. from New York, mm -hmm and Clinton lied, mm -hmm. and, and their people bailed. Not because of the behavior, mm -hmm. but because of the cover-up and the lies. That's it. See, they didn't tell all until at first, right? Right, right, right. right. They I didn't think tell I, the truth. You know, that's, this is so good. This is it. And it's the term I think is plausible deniability. So you say, right. I don't want to know. Because I don't want to have to go lie. But I'll tell you something interesting. This is pretty, the, the, okay, it sounds like an academic. The data are really clear on this. I bet, I don't make that much money, but if I were in industry, I'd bet that wholesale. Okay, here's the deal. When I ask press secretaries, what, so you'll, you'll talk to them and I'll say, what is the one thing that I, that I must remember? They said, there is a golden rule. You, as a press secretary, must never lie. Lie to the press. And it's kind of a syllogism that you can set up. It's a philosophical thing when you're doing logic, how you would set this up. It would go like this. If you lie, you can't be a source of information. Right. If you can't be a source of information, you can't be a press secretary. Therefore, if you lie, you can't be a press secretary. Right. Isn't that interesting? Right. And this is, I mean, I, you know, like, uh, that's the, I mean, that's like, like in the book and stuff. And I mean, the book has got, 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 it's like 400 pages and I'm trying to make it perfect. I got to get it out. I got three publishers looking at it now, just so you know. But, but Mike McCurry didn't know he was lying. He didn't know. And he didn't know that Clinton had lied to him. So there's the thing. And I think that he wasn't doing it because of plausible deniability. Clinton just lied, yeah. thinking it could get away with it. 
And maybe if the truth had come out and he did what he said here and asking for forgiveness, maybe he never would have been impeached either. Well, there's the thing. I mean, you know, it's got. When I, I think you'll agree with this. When you give political examples, like I give them in class a lot because I was in D.C. for ten years, you have to. Uh, uh, you, can't, you can't say, "Well, Hillary," and then if you're going to say something critical, someone says, "Well, I, I love Hillary," I can't, and they don't listen, or "I hate Hillary," and they don't listen, right? To make the, the argument, you can learn a lot of. Hillary has very low perceived as low in trustability. Mm -hmm. Objectively, that's where she is. Mm -hmm. I say that to my sisters, and they're like, why are you picking on Hillary? And I'm like, well, that, once we do that, once we move out of the realm mm -hmm. to the personal, I like her, she's not being treated fairly. Once you do that, then you leave the discussion, and you can't do an analysis of it anymore. Right. Does that make sense to you? Right. So if you're going to use the political examples, I do it with my class. Guys, I'm really against the death penalty. You can Google, I'm, I'm against the death penalty. But beyond that, I don't tell the students much. And I don't use the class time to say, this is why I'm against the death penalty. That isn't, that isn't what they're there for. Make sense to you? But as we think about this notion, there has to be this trust between the member of Congress right. and the person who will take a bullet for him or her. Right. And, and if the trust, trust is betrayed, as with Clinton, right. then the press secretary is it's caught. Right. Yeah. And it's either you're going to stay with someone you don't trust who lies, right. or you're going to quit the best job in the world for a press secretary. It's, so this is this is like a discussion for class. I mean, it's a it's a great discussion. It's a great thing to think about. But think about this a little bit. McCurry then, if he knew, would have to go before the press corps, or right. this member of Congress's press secretary would have to talk to the local reporter and lie. Right. Well, once you lie, remember the syllogism, you can't be a source. Right. Do you see the conundrum? So, uh, anyway, is that, is that okay for the case study? Is that is that good? The last thing I want to share here is more of like a, like I guess you say, like an academic or a philosophical concept. It's number, it's number five on this sheet. And it's, how would you comment perception is reality? I mean, the perception of this member of Congress has changed. Our reality of him has changed. But we never knew his reality. We only knew that which was created. Does that make sense? We didn't know it was cheating, right? So I don't know, I'm trying to be like down the middle and fair on this, but I don't want to just say, I think it's too easy to say, well, he's a jerk, and so therefore, you know, he's, a, you know, I think that's, that's an easy out. I think to look at this intellectually, ask us to do more, to look at the strategy, how you would do this. And the only thing I'll say in fairness to the guy is, in my life, I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect either. Do you know what I mean? So maybe the most basic thing is, well, who's not perfect? The other press secretary goes, well, no, this line, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a religious example, so I'll do this. He said, there's this, there's this Bible quote, this is Bible story, where there's a, somebody caught in adultery. So they're going to stone her, right? They're going to throw stones at her and kill her. So Jesus, the historical Jesus said, the one who's not committed sin, throw the first stone. So this press that I was talking to said, if his group is evangelical, maybe this is something. So then, anyway, that's what they that's what they share. So make of that what you want. Anyway, is that good? You want can we go on to some of this other stuff? You guys good? Okay. So um, and I got another case study. We got time, but thanks for for recommending. I got to do that more. Does that because it makes it real? I guess right. I think it's. I worry sometimes it's kind of esoterically. You don't really get it. So. They're nice pictures, though, aren't they? I mean, it holds your attention, right? I had a student from China make these for me. I said, find pictures that, that are entertaining for you, and we'll use those. I like those. <laughs> so it's a little bit about what Dr. Barrow was just getting at. I hate my boss. I love my boss. Here's the answer. They love my boss so much. I mean, there's a few things that, that come out that are just predictable. One is, don't lie. That's what they say. The second is they have a close and core, they have a close relationship with a member of Congress. Not necessarily buddy buddy, but they know this member of Congress and they have a respect for that individual. Does that make sense to you? And three, we haven't talked much about it, but when it comes to the media, they have a guarded relationship. They must be honest, but they are also guarded. Right. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was in Washington, D.C., there was a president, the first George Bush said, I don't, sorry, Genesis, but it's a good illustration. I don't like broccoli. All right. 
So what we did was we arranged that we would give 10 tons of broccoli to the White House. And you know broccoli has like what they call the stem and then the florets? So we took the florets of the most pretty broccoli and we put it where the camera would shine. And then we put water on it and sprayed it. And it looked really good. And we wore broccoli boutonnieres and it looked really good. Was that manipulation? Well, we weren't telling the whole story. We were putting our best foot forward. And I think that's what we mean by guarded honesty. But let me share this concept with you. People say, I want the whole truth. And my response to that is that you can't get the whole truth. It's not possible for a member of Congress who is anti-death penalty. It's not, it's not conducive to say, every time he makes a, she makes a statement about anti-death penalty, she makes one for it. Then she makes one, you know what I mean? To do that. So many people say, well, that's just the end of, the, of our presentation. Is this good for democracy? And to let the cat out of the bag a little bit, I think that this robust discussion is, is probably a good thing to do. And the press are to do a good role. Students have said, you know, yeah, but they're, they're spinning us, they're hacks, they're flags. And I'm like, well, maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. But aren't we all doing that to some degree? <laughs> I mean, anybody wearing makeup today? How about yours? I'll give you an example. <laughs> Example. I used to live in the residence hall at Boston University. And I would see the students in class, like hair pulled back, you know, no makeup or anything. And then on Thursday night and Friday night, I'd be going into the dorm room. I lived in the dorm in a special apartment in the dorm for professors. And they'd all be dressed up. They didn't even smell the same. They looked, they like just, they like, and I'm like, what the heck happened to you? Was that manipulation? Or was it putting your best foot forward? Something to think, just something to think about. All right, so let's continue on. Um, <laughs> this is a good one. I like the old TV set. All right, that's enough of that. Okay, so. In answer to the open-ended question, what words would a typical journalist use to describe the typical press secretary? And I want to put this in perspective for you guys. So don't read it for a minute. Let me just get your attention. This is from about 19 years ago. Okay, but I think it still illustrates the point, but of course in the new media environment we're dealing with something different. But in my interviews and my conversations today, this quote holds up really well, but I can't say that the data, the numbers, the data, are not, each data is necessarily still accurate. But I think, I think it's worth keeping in. In answer to the open-ended question, what words would a typical journalist use to describe a typical press secretary? One third of respondents said heck or flag, and only 21% used the word helpful. Negative comments outweigh positive by a factor of two to one. In later questioning, 44% of press secretaries agreed with the statement that, quote, journalists believe that press secretaries are self-serving hacks. Has anyone ever been on a whale watch? You been on one? Have you been on one? Did you notice on the whale there's the barnacles that attach to the whale? There's like, they're like shellfish that live off the whale. Well, the whale needs the barnacles, and the barnacles need the whale. It's a symbiotic relationship. It's mutually beneficial. And to some degree, that describes the relationship between press secretaries and at least traditional reporters. They need each other. And so that's, I think that guarded honesty is probably a pretty accurate assessment of that. They must be honest, but they are guarded. They would prefer that the florets are shown and not the stem. Is that manipulative? I don't know. Is it a robust democracy when everybody shows the florets as best they can and we let the debate continue? Something to think about. Let's continue on. How do they work with the media? Well, picture a football field. This is kind of good. Picture a one, I, just, I came up with this, I like this one. <laughs> picture a 100 yard foot, you guys know football, you know soccer. You can use a soccer field if you want. Soccer is more relevant. Filled with millions of blades of grass. Imagine that collectively all the grass represents the history of human communication dating back to the caveman days. Now take one blade of grass, hold it, tear off just the top of it and throw the rest away. What you're holding, as I've indicated on this earlier, is the percentage of time that press secretaries and other PR professionals have been able to utilize new media. That's profound. And it's happening so quickly that where we are now is you can tip off a little tip of the blade of that grass that you're holding, and that's where we are. In five years, tip off another one, that's where we, does that make sense to you? So this is really what's going on. This is one of the things, when the book got big, it's three, like 400 pages, 390 pages, and it's got to, I gotta got get it published. But 
the point is that I mean, it's just kind of exciting to track this. Like, do you get bored with this? You really don't, because the stories are alive, the press secretaries are alive, the personalities are alive, the scandals are alive, the good things are alive, the politics is alive, and new media just pumps it up. More and more information. Let's go to the next slide. All right, this is kind of an interesting thing. So, okay, so this is kind of an academic. I'll do kind of an academic thing with you guys now. It's kind of an interesting thing to think about. All right. So these are the issues, stem cell research, gun control, abortion, gay rights, immigration, transgender rights in bathrooms. We've heard about that recently? It's huge, yeah. It's really big right now. It's on the front burner, right? Okay, so as we think about that, think of all the issues, all the social, political, cultural, and economic issues. Again, four variables. Social, political, cultural, and economic. All these issues, school funding, student loans, immigration, relationship with Saudi Arabia, been in the paper fairly recently, right? We know that's going on there, so something's going on there. Jeez, the presidential election, what do we do with that? What's his name? Ted Cruz just picked uh, Carly Fiorina as his vice president. That just happened today. The vice presidents are all this stuff's going on. So what issues do the members of Congress, and, oh, I'm sorry, am I okay? Yep. Okay, what issues do the members of Congress, and by extension, their press secretaries focus on? Because you can't focus on every issue. So how do they determine the issues about, at its most basic level, you're going to write a news release, or you're going to blog, or you're going to send a tweet. Which issues? Well, I tried to figure that out, and this is where Mel, Janice knows him, and he was my, he was a mentor, Mel was my mentor, and Janice was my mentor, but. Otto, you can't, yeah. Well, Otto more currently is, but he never taught me, you know what I mean? He's, yeah. so, and we didn't have offices next to each other. You, you mentored me, so. As we think about this, though, it becomes kind of interesting. And I'm relating to a, a conversation I had with a press secretary from California. And this is a direct quote. I think, this, I, think I got this quote right. It might be coming up. It's like a wave, man. It's like a wave. Like a wave. You know, surfers, how they, they ride waves. I said, what are you talking about? He said, that's what we do. We ride a wave. So right now, today, many press secretaries are riding the wave of Ted Cruz's announcement this afternoon that he's picking Carly Fiorina as his vice president. A couple days ago, they were riding the wave in Saudi Arabia. A little while before that, they were riding the wave and there were bad optics with Clinton in, in, uh, with uh, Obama in Cuba, dancing. You with me on that? They're riding the wave. So what we find is that different members of Congress ride waves the press secretaries ride them when it's beneficial to the member of Congress, and then jump off and ride another one when it's beneficial. So maybe you're riding the Ted Cruz wave today. Maybe tomorrow you're riding the Saudi Arabia. God forbid there's a, a, somebody's shot, then you're riding that wave. But wait a minute. You're known as a fundamentalist Christian. You're going to ride the pro-school choice wave. Wayne says to you, you're a radical liberal. You're going to ride increased welfare benefits. I mean, yeah, you know what I mean? so, so you ride these waves that are a benefit to the member of Congress. People say, well, where do the waves come from? They can come from current issues. They can come from committees or subcommittees on which the members serve. So if you're a member and you're on the agricultural committee, you ride, you're more inclined to ride an agricultural wave. They come from issues important to the member of Congress's district. So if your district is a farming area, you're going to be more inclined to ride farming ways. But isn't that kind of interesting? So Mel used to tell me there's a great theory that can be developed from this, and I tried to write it up once, and I wrote it up to give it back to me and said, I don't understand this, and I'm like, I don't understand it either. <laughs> that was the deal. So that makes sense, isn't it? So that's so, you guys doing okay? Everybody doing all right? All right. It's like a wave, man. I find stuff issues goes in waves. The way stories ebb and flow. You get a little wave of a particular story, and if your boss is an appropriate committee assignment, or an appropriate expertise, or an appropriate geographical location. You try to catch it. Sometimes, you'll just ride off the back of a wave and nothing will happen. Some other times, you'll catch it and ride it for your boss. And one press secretary said, you better be aware of waves because they can knock you down and knock you out. Mm -hmm. And he actually used this term. They can knock you right out of the picture. Right. So if you don't jump on a wave that's an important wave, there's a, a cause of racism. You say, well, that's nothing, for example. You should have jumped on it because the racism was prevalent. 
and therefore you get knocked out. Does that make sense to you? So that's an interesting thing, the notion of waves. <laughs> you know, I gotta tell you, truth, I don't know who Mark Merrick is, maybe you guys know, I gotta, I gotta look it up, I should know this, but these gives you a great quote. The dirty little secret of Washington, D.C. that everybody knows but few dare to acknowledge. Congressional staff, that's press secretaries and others, serve as an unelected continuum from which there is no escape. The next one was mine. I think this is pretty good. Like, most of what I say is not very good, but this is like, I'm trying, this I thought that was pretty good. The member of Congress has power, and the press secretary is the member of Congress. That's pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, but that's the notion. So, you know, the only power that the press secretary, I'm working for, if, if, sorry, so Adrian, I'm working for you. My only power comes from you. Once you leave office, I'm inconsequential. And if I think there's some stories about presidents who took it on themselves and assumed they had more power. So there is something that happens with these people. It's an interesting thing. And again, I say these people. I can only talk about you collectively in general terms because they're all independent. This is what's so interesting. People would assume, well, they have big egos. Mm -hmm. They're going to have big egos. What I find oftentimes is that it's sometimes a little bit the opposite of that because they have to put their ego on hold because the member of Congress is always up, right? Mm -hmm. Is always on the front burner, not they. So they can stay up all night dealing with it. This guy's, this poor guy's, he, she or he might have stayed up all night dealing with it, trying what to do. Nobody knows the person's name. They solve it. He gets reelected. Everything works out okay. The crisis communication strategy works. Press secretary was involved with that. No credit. So, I mean, most of what I've shared with you today is based on like like um, empirical evidence or data and stuff, you know. But this is an opinion. People ask me sometimes, "Do you like these people?" Well, first, I like individual ones, just like when in any group you like members of the group. The Celtics, the basketball team, who likes it. But I have to tell you, I really like them. I like that they are willing to give someone else credit. I like the dedication that they put into their positions. I like their refusal to lie, their refusal to do that. And I just have to tell you that they give me time. And they, I mean, I'm not, I mean <clears throat> there's no, I, I just like them. There's some jerks, like some are jerks and some are full of themselves and stuff. But almost without exception, do you know Mike Dodds? Do you know Mike Dodds? He was a press I mean, Come on, he's a great guy. Because we think about that, that's kind of an interesting thing that comes up oftentimes. So they have to relinquish the power. Now here's the question, my friends. Okay, so I'm doing the dissertation, right? And I haven't figured this out for like 25 years. I still don't know the answer, right? So here's what's going on. And in a newbie environment, it's even more complicated. But here's what's going on. Is their work good for democracy? Put another way, if someone vehemently tries to shape a perception that builds an image about someone that determines your reality, is that good? Now, if you are pro-death penalty, if you're pro-death penalty, they're no good. If you're anti-death penalty, they're great. You get what I'm saying? I mean, I don't really mean, you know what I mean. So the question came up, and the dissertation committee wanted me to answer this, and I've been trying to figure it out for, for a long time. Is it good for democracy? Some people say absolutely not. They're hacks, they're flacks, they're spin doctors, they just put out one point of view. Other people say, oh no, they're not only good for democracy, they're essential for democracy because they are the individuals who share the encoding, who put out the messages, build relationships that form our democracy. So are they good or are they bad? Well, so you're twisted. And, my opinion here isn't really that important. It's your opinion that, that really matters on this, but I want to have you consider that a robust debate on informed citizenry is important for democracy. Right? Now, a cynic would say, well, they don't inform us, they spin us. I mean, I got the whole argument both ways. But I think ultimately they, they do play a role, but I think that the media have to play a role as well. Mm -hmm. And so as we think about this, I'm only talking about traditional media. We can talk about a new 
I used to go into, uh, you remember Nick Mills? Mm -hmm. I used to go into a, to a journalism professor's class. Is he still there? No, he retired. You're kidding. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's doing like Yeah, you know, he was great. He's a good guy. So I'd go into his class and it's set up. I kind of wouldn't like to fit the fire. It's okay to fit the, hit the firing squad. I mean, it's kind of like, it's like PR people are used to being fired upon. It's not that big a deal. So, and he's like, this is a spin doctor. This is, and he'd read a quote about, you know, these people are spinning journalists. And so I'd go on and on. I'd say, well, you know, we do. We put our, our, our best foot forward. Some of us are unethical. Toxic sludge is not good for you. Don't let me tell you it is. I think it's immoral to promote the death penalty. Just my opinion, not, not, not necessarily shared. It makes sense to you? So as we think about this, of course there is. But I'd say, Nick, you know, you guys got to play a role in this too. Right. You guys have some notion that if you're going to create these stories, try to make them at least fair. I'm not talking about liberal bias in the mainstream. I'm not really doing it. I mean, you can, that's part of it. But try, or at least, if you want to emphasize something, emphasize in fairness. Right? So, and he was always a little bit taken aback by that. Because I'd call him. I'd say, you know, you guys got to play a role in this too. But imagine what can happen, and it does happen. When we have a vigorous debate and the traditional media give us some kind of information, it's really interesting. It could be investigatory reporting or it could be, I think it's a magic thing. I mean, when that happens, the democracy's well served. America's well served. Does that make sense to you? I think that's a good thing. So my opinion, with which you're free to disagree, is that ultimately they do something that's important. Now, if I didn't like them personally so much, I might have a different opinion, because I'm human and I might respond that way. But I've thought about this a lot. I think about that. But I do think it's up to the media. You've got to give some kind of, I have a schizophrenic life, because I literally read the New York Times and the New York Post, and I read them together, and it just confuses me. And, you know what I mean? It's really an interesting thing when you, when you can manage that. So that's kind of my, that's not, I don't want to be political too political, but anyway, I'll just show you. So as you think about it, this is what one said to me. There's Nancy Pelosi. This was the, Nancy Pelosi in the middle was, she was the Speaker of the House, the first woman who was the Speaker of the House. And so, like her or not, she showed, she has a, she's an um, iconic piece of American history. From now forward, she will always be the first woman to speak of the House. This is what somebody said to me. I wish I could step back far enough to really see my job, this is what press secretary said, and the job of my colleagues, like you are. Because I feel like I'm so close to it that I can't see clearly. And I probably tend to be more cynical. I probably take things for granted. And the only time I can really appreciate what we do is when I step back away from it. So there is a subtext to many of the press secretary's work that I think it's, it's emerged. I, don't, I mean, I don't have enough data, I guess, to say it definitively or to say it really definitively. But I think that, that many feel that they are playing an important role as educators. They are educating us about issues, and they see value in that. I have to consider about every other, this is what another press secretary said, I have to consider about every other day on my job that I work for someone who's been elected to office, who the people have put a trust in. Moreover, that someone is working for a federal government that, for better or worse, is the government that's been established by the people in our Constitution. And uh, it's a weighty responsibility. <laughs> I think it's a pretty good quote. Because it kind of draws us back to what we said initially, and that's simply this notion that this isn't fun and games. Well, it is, but it's not really. You know what I mean? It's kind of a game, but it's a game with consequences. Now, I want to be clear here. I don't want to overblow the importance of every press center. You can say logically, if there's 500, it's for roughly 435 on the House side, House of Representatives, plus five who work for the different delegations, roughly speaking. And then in the Senate side, you might have a press secretary and a press aide. So let's say roughly, I don't know, five, six, 550, 600, something like that. Everyone is doing something important. And everyone can't make a major influence on our lives, on your life and my life. 
but they can influence us, and we don't know who they are. I could not divorce by their own personal feelings from what they had to do for their boss. They couldn't do it, which brings us back to the case study. Thank you. So as we think about it, that's kind of the, hi, Eddie, hi. Um, so that's kind of a, a breakdown on this. But there are five points that I want to make, make sure are very, that are just kind of clear for us today, okay? okay. Point number one is that these individuals exist and we don't know who they are. Fair enough? Point number two is that they have a very close relationship with a member of Congress and a guarded relationship with the media. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Point number three, in terms of their values, their ethical system, to do the job, most of them have values affinitive or that match those of the member with whom they work. But if they don't match, the members' values supersede theirs. Point number four, we are in uncharted territory. And this is one of the things that's holding me up on the book. I have to stop. Janice is going to kick me to get this thing done. I do have a, I do have a mention to thank you in there, by the way. Did I no. give you the pen? Yes, yeah, give you the pen. Keep writing. Keep writing. That's true. <clears throat> we are in uncharted territory, and if we have two or three minutes, I'll do this. And if we, how are we doing for time? How are we doing for? We have like seven minutes. Oh, good. Okay, good. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, good. Because I can finish with what I was what I want to do. Um, we are in uncharted territory because we are in a new media environment, which I'm suggesting to you is not massive, but it's profound. I don't know where we're going with it. I do know that it's there. I want to be very clear. I might have given a wrong impression. The press secretaries are certainly using new media, mm -hmm. but if we assume that that's all they're using, that's wrong. And the last point that I want to raise with you guys is this. Is this good for our democracy? I mean, I think in an educational institution, we should examine that question a little bit. We can talk about the tactics and how you do it. And that's, so those are like the five points that I wanted to get across, okay? So the last thing, if I got, I'll take like five minutes, seven minutes, and then we'll be done. Is that okay? Is, are you guys, can you guys hang in there? For, and this is new, this is a new thing, so you can pick this up. Is this okay with you guys, or? Okay, we'll be relatively quick, okay, so. Everybody has a mobile device, yes? Everybody has a mobile device, right? I've been thinking about this. There's a great thinker I know in Western Massachusetts who says, is this a good thing? Just bear with me. We all have a mobile device. What we know is that that mobile device takes us from the present. So nobody was on their mobile device tonight, but if you were, you would be someplace other than with me, with us. You can carry this mobile device on your hip and it can be part of who you are day to day. Isn't that a good thing? I don't know. We can get information from anywhere in the world at any time. Isn't that a good thing? I, I don't know. As we begin to think about this, what these mobile devices do is they remove us from the present. We are leaving the present. When you look at the great religious traditions, from New Age to the most traditional, there is always a connection where you are present to the divine. There's some presence, praying five times a day, you are present to the divine. The Christian tradition, the Buddhist tradition, as I understand it, the New Age, there's a presence. Can we be present? Can we be present? Something to think, just something to, to ponder for a minute. Something to think about. Now, I think about television. Between roughly 1950 and 1960, television permeated the U.S. The terms they use are, are diffusion and adoption. 
So all of a sudden, when I'm studying this at Syracuse, the average TV is out in the average U.S. household about six and a half hours a day. The technology took over, and so you don't believe, I said, I don't believe that. And then I would drive home through the inner city up to the suburbs, and I'd see, you can see it tonight. And there's lots of data saying that we are on screens even more than that today. Is that a good thing? So as we think about this, I think about the press secretaries, and what I want to study next is the degree to which these devices have somehow pulled them from the present. Where do they go? There's a type of research called an autoethnography, and that is where you look into yourself, and you therefore from yourself determine the data to bring this out. It's somewhat controversial. But I don't have a mobile device. I don't have a phone, a cell phone. I don't carry one. And so I've been asking people over the years, I've been saying that to them over the years, three years. Now, three years ago, the response I got was, how do you not live with that? Fair enough. How do you, like, how do you not have it? You know what I'm hearing now more? Any guesses? I'm good for you. Yeah. <laughs> So if there's any, well, now that, that, that's only anecdotal, right? You talk to people and they tell you this, and I mean, maybe you can say, well, you're not talking to the right people, et cetera. But do we have situational awareness? Thank you all for not going on mobile devices tonight. Are we aware of the situation? Are we aware when we get on a plane, not to say what's going on here and kind of contact my partner, but where's the nearest exit in case the plane has a problem? So this is kind of what I'm thinking about in terms of the new research with the press secretaries. Looking at these folks in this venue and seeing if new media are really serving them, if these devices are serving them as well as they can. I know that's radical. I know it's countercultural. I know many people don't agree with me. And I know there's lots of arguments against for this. But I simply raise it as a question to ponder as you go out. Are you happier? And are we meant to be available 24-7? So that's it, you guys. Thank you.